make some opening remarks. Is feminism dead? And if so, what did it die of? In the mid-90s, there was a Time Cover magazine which showed us Susan B. Anthony from 19th century, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and then seemed as if the destiny of feminism was to arrive at you-know-who. And if that was the case, I think if feminism died, it died of starvation. Obviously, the anorexic image of the woman, and I show you this, which is an interesting advert, which is to say 20 years ago, the average fashion model weighed six <coughs> times less than the average woman. Nowadays, the average fashion model weighs 23 times less than the average woman. So I think starvation is certainly part of what's happened to women, and I think that's significant. You will remember Germaine Greer's, sorry, we seem to have lost uh, Germaine Greer's, I've got it, but it's not showing up here, <coughs> famous cover of the female eunuch, which was reused in the 1980s to declare that we are now in post-feminism uh, with a Madonna sexualized corset <coughs> as opposed to the notion of a body. So I'm going to put those images aside. We're going to move to part two, and here is a much more serious thought. Now, one of the things I do is I study uh, issues to do with the cultural memory of the Holocaust, and the dominant feature in that discourse is the notion that our epoch is after Auschwitz. That's to say that we come after in time, and we witness and live the effects of Auschwitz, which are now the condition of our human living and dying. And at the same time, the word nach in German means towards, not just after in time, but towards. And he argues that when you have a major historic event, you have to remain forever oriented towards it. You are going to journey towards it to keep it in our sights because it was a historically defining event in the history of humanity. Now, you may think this is a very treacherous thing to do, but I want you to think what might it mean not catastrophically, as some people think feminism was for the history of the world, but for those of us who think it was one of the great things that happened, if we understood our era as after feminism, that's to say we do come after a historic series of events, which, whose history I'm going to talk about in greater detail, but also that we have to remain faithful to it. We must not let the Time magazine, the wishing it dead, because performatively speech acts can kill nor can we want to say that we become in, not feminism, but post-feminism, something else. This is not a finished business. So we need to go back a little bit, and I want to introduce myself by remembering the 1970s, because what you have in front of you is what was called recently, in 2007, by a Swedish magazine, a feminist veteran. <laughs> okay? And I'm a veteran of the women's movement. Okay? This is me as a much younger person, carnivalesquely joining in one of the extraordinary th things which I want to bring back into your attention, was when men and women, but led by women, got together and moved. We moved in the streets, we moved uh, the whole of the Houses of Parliament to pass legislation, we moved by writing and producing magazines and so forth. And I want to contrast this image of the group, the women, women's lobby, women's uh, report, which were our two things, with something which will be no doubt in your memories from just very recently, the uh, press responses to the death of Margaret Thatcher. Presented here as the woman, the one, who saved Britain. Now, I want you to set against the sense of collective social and cultural movements with this idea of the one woman. And of course, she was really very, very... Um, beloved by the feminists, as you know. She says, the feminists hate me, don't they? And I don't blame them, for I hate feminism. It is poison. Now, in the reporting of this uh, event of Margaret Thatcher dying, I want to draw your attention to the fact to the language. Britain will remember its first female prime minister. Britain's first female prime minister with her husband, Dennis. Breaking Margaret Thatcher, Britain's first female prime minister passed away. Now, one of the great events of feminism, or effects of feminism, so if we come after feminism, is that we are women, right? Men and women are social categories. Male and female should be reserved for the natural history program. David Attenborough can have males and females running around doing all sorts of things, usually only sex, basically, and eating. But men and women are social categories, and the struggle for us to be women for that to have some meaning in the world is one of the great important issues. And when my students come to me and talk about themselves as females, 
or when this was on the news, I would shout every time they say female prime minister, woman prime minister, I would say, we fought to be women, you know, where is this continent? And what is happening to our young people whose ideas of themselves is that they are males and females? You will see what happens. Okay, so here, the women's liberation movement again. Now, this is interesting because I picked up on the uh, sort of networks I belong to that recently the New York Times reported that Wikipedia has got too many American novelists on their list. So they decided to subcategorize them. What category? Not men and women, but novelists and female novelists. So there are all male lists of American novelists, and then there are all female lists of women novelists. Now, does this remind you of something? Well, for me, it reminds me of the first book I ever wrote with Rosia Kaparka, where we pointed out the power of language. By calling our book Old Mistresses, we reminded you there's no adequate feminine equivalent to the reverential term old master. Old mistress immediately shifts you from being skilled, crafting, dominant into the category of elderly, rejected sexual partner. <laughs> okay. Now, Ed Miliband made a very interesting speak, speech in Parliament uh, when they discussed the death of Margaret Thatcher, in which he gave us a story which many people would think is the great feminist story. The young woman from, uh, you know, from Grantham, the child of a grocer, particularly the daughter of a grocer, who broke the mould. She was a woman at Oxford when there was not a single woman who held a professorship, and only 6% of the British population who was women went to university. Okay? But she wasn't alone. Remember the great Rosalind Franklin, who was one of the great discoverers of the uh, double helix of, the, of, of um, DNA. And obviously, we have the great history of the double Nobel Prize woman, Marie Curie. So we mustn't forget those. Miliband went on to say, of course, she was a candidate for Parliament when very much opposition. She was an MP when only 4% of the MPs were women. She was the only woman in the cabinet and remained so she had no other woman in her cabinet. And of course, she was the first woman prime minister. Now, is that what feminism was meant to give us? Okay, I'll leave you with that thought. Well, we turn slightly sideways to go back to the media view and contemporary feminists. What you'll find in the media nowadays is a trivialization of the feminist movement and a complete ignorance of feminist thought. And this is a failed understanding of the historic significance. So that we have now, however, also, not merely the old struggles to remember, but new struggles against an even more rampant sexualization of women, the premature sexualization of children, and the dominance of pornography is the only model for sexuality. So if we look at the company magazine and said, what is feminism in 2010? The myth. Now, nobody ever burned a bra. Right? Be silly. If you don't need a bra, you don't wear one. If you do need a bra, you don't burn it. <laughs> okay? What actually had happened is that there was a freedom trash can in 1968 in, during a demonstration in which women were invited to throw away any object that would make them feel freer in its discarding. And then they asked to burn them, but the uh, authorities said, since there's a boardwalk, we can't have any fires, so you just have to take it to the dump. So there was no mythic magic for this. Now, some of you might have come across Nina Power, who is a young uh, political theorist, a feminist, who's written a book condemning where we've got to. She writes a wonderful condemnation of one-dimensional woman, which is what is seen to be the new feminist. And she writes, where have all the interesting women gone? Well, they're obviously all here. If the contemporary portrayal of womankind is to be believed, contemporary female achievement would culminate in the ownership of an expensive handbag, a vibrator, a job, an apartment, and a man, probably in that order. Please note the photograph below because I'm going to move on to her next point. How has it come to this? Did the desires of 20th century women's liberation achieve their fulfillment in a shopper's paradise of naughty pampering, playboy bunny pendants, and bikini waxes? That the height of supposed female emancipation coincides so perfectly with consumerism 
is a miserable index of a politically desolate time. And on the other hand, she says, and I've just drawn attention to it, that she says, we should remember that at one time, feminism was a great generator of new thoughts and new modes of existence. And if feminism takes this opportunity to shake off its current imperialist and consumerist sheen, it could once again place its vital transformative political demands center stage and shuffle off its one current one-dimensionality. So <coughs> we're going to throw away that particular image. And I just want to show from my field a little reminder, because we have the great image of the um, Venus from classical times, who is notably hairless. We have the translation of that into somewhat kitschy 19th century images, but nowadays it's de rigueur. And Gail Dines, who is going to be speaking in London, I think on the June the 11th next week, has written a book called Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, which she interviewed young women at uh, various Ivy League universities for whom the necessity to be Brazilian waxed is now the demand. This was once, as you can see, the formation <coughs> of the adult actors, in adult stars in porn. It's now normal. And one way you can get a, avoid, so some of you will tell me, having to have sex if you go to a bar, is to say you failed to shave or wax. It used to be I got my period, but now it's I'm too hairy for sex. <laughs> and then I just want to quote this one here. Women are much more understanding of their true purpose in life than ever before, says Max Hardcore, pornographer. The purpose is, of course, to be receptacles of love, in other words, fuck dolls. So if you think this is not serious, it is infinitely more serious than the jolly days of the 1970s. What young women face today is nothing, is, is infinitely, as I say, worse. Now, this of course is related not just really <coughs> to certain cosmetic engineering, and even now, of course, women are obliged to have genital surgery to make sure their cunts look as nice and smooth as the ones in the porn movies. And this is, there was a Guardian report the other day where a girl said, my boyfriend thinks my vagina is ugly. Well, I used to worry that I had hair under my armpits or on my legs, and, you know, that maybe I was not as slim as I should be. But the idea that everything about me is potentially ugly is this issue that we really have to take much, much more deeply. Because this is linked to the real violence against women. Because what is it that the world thinks women are? Okay, we live in relative safety here. But as Angelina Jolie spoke about this at the GH conference recently, uh, that rape and sexual violence in war zones is a normal part of conflict. Right? There was a report on the newspapers of somewhere in the Democratic Congo where the soldiers, the state soldiers, the nation soldiers, the government soldiers came in, and one young man of 19 reported raping 53 women. Now, what does this man have in his head? in relation to a fellow human being, that they should be perceived as fuck dolls. Okay, so these two ends of the problem, I think, are very serious. And of course, you will remember in December, the enormous upheaval in India in response to the hideous rape and murder of a young student, which again brought masses of women into the street. And like the older period, we have this presence of their bodies in the street and the performative speech of their defiance of the notion of becoming these kinds of objects, of not having their lives secured and safe within the world in which they have to live. The world belongs to women too. Women want to be free, not tearful. Okay? And this takes us back to remembering this historic significance of what actually happened in the late 19th century. Now, almost nobody teaches the suffragette movement in history now, and if you think of the suffragette, because it's got the et on the end, we think, this is kind of cute. But these women took on, the militantly took on the British state. No other movement challenged the full might of the British state and didn't kill anybody, although one person killed themselves. They bombed, the suffragettes bombed the uh, post offices because, and the post boxes because they wanted to break up communication. They destroyed property because they knew that would hurt certain kinds of them. But they never attacked people. But they did also take to the streets, whether dressed in their beautiful Victorian gowns, 
votes for women, or here marching with the million signatures which was necessary to get the amendment for the vote in America. Now, the vote is what people think that women campaigned for, but the suffragettes did something infinitely more exciting. And I want to give you this thought because I think it is such a revelation. They didn't struggle for equality. They struggled for the right to revolt. Okay, that's what Emmeline Pankhurst and the subject, they introduced the right to say we will not let this world be as it is. We don't know what we want it to be because that will be a joint <coughs> creation of those of us who participate, men as women. So it wasn't to say, I just want this and then I'll be happy. It was for the right to say the way the world is, is not good enough. And why is it not good enough? Because, and I want to take you, just go through this a little bit more quickly, to show you how much it is, because even when the, the um, 19th Amendment was to the American uh, Constitution, which gave them the vote, it did not produce the change that's necessary. And again, 30 or 40 or 50 years later, you had to see an extraordinary thing where women once again claimed the right, shall we say, to be revolting, to revolt, right? Under the banner of women of the world unite, women take to the street. So I want you to think about what you're seeing in this photograph. It's not just a document of some crazy little you know, demonstration. It's extraordinary that the streets of New York, of the Fifth Avenue, were filled, filled to absolute expansion, explosion, with women together. Now this is something also that the society finds very difficult, right? Because if you can make women think their only purpose is to be, as I've quoted, fuck dolls, you deny them the right to find themselves interesting. So one of the powers of feminism was the first movement to love women. Not sexually, not erotically, they're not a whole bunch of lesbians, which is the usual condemnation. <coughs> Feminists are, you know, man-hating lesbians. Many, many are lesbians, many, many are straight, many, many, many are celibate, blah, blah, blah. But what it involves is love. That women are worth something. And what they've done is worth preserving or knowing about. What they write in their literature is right to be in our libraries. And it is what that has contributed is to be part of our understanding of humanity. So these are very, very important images to remind you of sometimes you need to revolt. Now, in the history of feminism, I went to ask, when was feminism? Now, some people will think, maybe, okay, I can accept the suffragettes, maybe I accept the 1970s, but actually, there's a medieval challenge. The first big text of feminism is, in fact, written in 1415 by Christine de Pizan, and here she's showing, presenting her book to the Queen of Spain, uh, France at the time, and it was called The Book of the City of, of Women. And what she did was to research every famous woman in the history of the world and imagine them all inhabiting a city of women, completely populated by philosophers, theologians, they would be architects, they would build their own city, they would be scholars, they would be embroiderers, they would be musicians, they would be potters, they would be everything. So we have that moment of fighting just the pure misogyny of the late medieval world. A second time of feminism is 18th century expansion of the, con of the concepts of the right of man. Now, when Mary Wollstonecroft declared the vindication of the rights of women, she wasn't asking for the vote. She was asking for women to have access to virtue, to being a kind of person who would have subtle sensibility, rational thought that needed education, that women should not be required to live their lives in absolute, I'm going to go to, pettiness. Because, of course, some women do like this. They want to remain petty. They do not want to take on the mantle of being the serious thinkers, of being challenged. So feminism is a trauma for many women, just as it is a trauma for men. And this is Mary Wollstonecraft, who says, I then would fain convince reasonable men of the importance of some of my remarks and prevail on them to weigh dispassionately the whole tenor of my observations. I appeal to their understandings and as a fellow creature claim in the name of my sex some interest in their hearts. I entreat them to assist, to emancipate their companion, to make her help <coughs> to them. 
would men but generously snap our chains and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience, <coughs> they must find us more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers, in a word, better citizens. That's a very different <coughs> conception of what we might think is going on than we. It's not the beginnings, it's her particular 18th century view. And she, as she so showed here using this Henry Fusley image, wanted women to stop being petty, trivial, by having no sense for, for their education. And then we arrive at the modernist claim for women's right to revolt, the cl revolutionary claim of women to determine the fullness of their own humanity and the expanded plurality of humanity in general. Now, I was terribly touched when I read this. Emmeline Pankhurst writing in her diary when she was in prison for her <coughs> five minutes. I say, I, you can't make your clock as I've got seven more. <laughs> okay. She says, I do not believe that men think that women are human beings like themselves. Now, just think about for that for a moment. Is that not exactly where the problem lies? Now, I'm sure all of the men in this room are here because they do. They've probably known real companionship, real sense of what it is to know another in their difference, right? This is perfectly possible and many, you know, great spirited people exist. But what we have to look at is the structure, which is even now more dangerous. If young men, as the program I watched recently called Teen Sex, are learning as to what sex is through pornography, what is it in their heads that a woman is? perhaps certainly not a human being like themselves. In the case of that Steuberville uh, young case where the little boys that were 15, 16, did not know they were doing anything wrong to the 15-year-old that they basically finger-fucked and run around with like a, a doll. Now, that seems to me where we have to confront what she's saying. Do men really understand that women being a human by themselves, is there evidence that we have really managed to persuade that, them to come to that. Okay? Men make the moral code, says Emmeline Pankhurst, they expect women to accept it. They have decided that it is utterly right and proper for them to fight for liberties and rights, but not for us to fight for ours. The moving spirit of militancy is the deep and abiding reverence for human life. We have to free half of the human race, the women, so that they can help to free the other half. These, I think, are worth keeping in our mind. And I will have to move on from this. Now, the dark years of the 20th century were the years when fascism closed down in its radical anti-feminist ideology, the moment of revolutionary politics and also revolutionary culture, the era of the great <coughs> poets, who lived in Paris, the literature that came out of it, the filmmakers who came out of it. We have a feminist cultural revolution in the 1920s and 30s, mostly focused on Paris, and then it is destroyed as the world is drawn into a war against fascism whose central premise was to reassert this radical asymmetry between men and women. And if you think I'm overplaying gender and fascism compared to you think, well, they were anti-Semitic, they committed a terrible genocide. The Jews were feminized. It's the same thinking. These are like women and they are like women breeders that have to be got rid of. Now the tragedy is that the allied victors absorbed the ideology that the fascists had brought back in the 20th century. In the 1950s we have the promotion of the idea that women belong in the home the absolute domesticity. And it was out of that came two of the most famous books, The Second Sex, as Simone de Beauvoir tried to write an autobiography and said, well, if I'm going to write in the I, who is a she, what is it to be a woman? And she undertook this extraordinary philosophical investigation into the creature that the world had created, not women as human beings, but the creature. And then Betty Friedan wrote the famous book from her research <coughs> in America into the world created by this allied, uh, this post-war absorption of an old, old, and I think very fascist gender ideology, where she wrote the book about the, 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 um, the problem that has no name. The sense of women saying, I got the vote, I even got the right to education, but I do not live a human life. 
You tell me what my destiny is, you do not give me the means to live a human life. And it was against that that the women un with Betty Friedan took to the streets, were forced into revolt in this movement. Now, the after effects, I've got two or three minutes, I just think, the after effects of feminism, what are they? The thing that is least visible in the media and in its representation is the massive intellectual revolution that came out of the women's movement. It created a women's studies movement. However, there are no women's studies degrees <coughs> at all in Britain anymore. The last closed down five years ago. Okay? But it's had an impact in every discipline. What your young people are studying at schools in A-level, in literature, in media studies, is the effect of people asking to think about gender, race, post-coloniality, sexuality, the school curriculum, and the shape of the education profession. So feminism has to be also remembered as a theoretical revolution, a deep philosophical struggle for the nature of humanity in terms of shared dignity and safety. So this is my um, view from my desk. Those are some of the books that I use. That is some of the feminist, as it were, literature that I draw on. It just fills the room. They are going to come and eat me one day. They get more and more as I get in. And they are representative of the first generation of women who went to university and studied in their own name, not as intellectual transvestites, but as women who loved women, wanted to know their literature, their art, their history, their thought, and then wanted to make an entire new architectural, sort of theoretical architecture that would try and understand the nature of humanity if both genders were understood always to have been equally productive of what culture is. Not separatism, but inclusion. Not half empty libraries and half empty bookcases, but full ones with the many voices. And this is what I call the feminist effect, a worldwide movement, a world literature, a theoretical architecture affecting every discipline and subject, producing gender-sensitive policies. Now, governments have to ask what is the impact of every policy because it will differentiate and fall. This one doesn't manage, it's just made everything but fall on women. And thinking about humanity, the creative differences, sorry for the spelling, and learning about its fundamental plurality. So this idea that you get in the, in the um, representations of Mrs. Thatcher or things, that what women wanted was to be the superman is wrong. What the feminist movement is to understand human plurality. And to end where I began, the Holocaust is a sign of what happens when a society decides it cannot really live with difference. It cannot encompass plurality. Right? And I'm suggesting that effectively we have witnessed over centuries, but certainly even worse, a feminicide, a killing of women as members of the human community, a forgetting of everything they wrote, a segregation and downgrading of that. And so we have to, as it were, understand that after feminism is really feminism still to come. And uh, this is my conclusion. It's about how we grasp the, now the legacies of the recurrent waves of feminist revolt, of women's mobilization in the name of loving, honoring, and seeking the safety and dignity of women. It's how we grasp the legacies of intellectual, cultural creativity worldwide, and how we remain faithful to the continuing worrying <coughs> away at issues of social justice and the safe <coughs> continuation of what we have to still invent, which is a human life that we can all live side by side in all our differences and plurality. Thank you. It is one minute 11 over. <laughs>